So if, if you and I think of manufacturing, we are thinking of a big factory uh, in Michigan or Ohio or, or Pennsylvania. And uh, clearly the, the trends that are underway, uh, this, that world is changing. So where you have much more distributed supply chains, design anywhere, manufacture anywhere. Uh, so we are, we are going to transform manufacturing as we have known into this very distributed uh, system that's uh, really happening right now. And I think the funding that NSF is putting into it is going to accelerate uh, that, that trend. Uh, connected to it is uh, the, the whole area of biomanufacturing. Uh, NSF is making significant investments in, in that space and we fully expect over time uh, for biomanufacturing to become a significant uh, growth area. Uh, energy and environment remain a big priority for our National Science Foundation and I see again in enormous possibilities for the future. Uh, take for example uh, storage, battery storage uh, or, or energy storage is in general. Uh, I think uh, a great deal of research is happening in that space and that can be absolutely revolutionary. Uh, same thing with renewable sources of, of energy. Uh, again, revolutionary impacts are, are going to be felt and, and seen in the in the coming years. Another direction that we find very exciting uh, is infusion of all things cyber into, into what we do. So infusion of computers, communications, networks, uh, and uh, control and so forth. And I can just take a couple of areas where I think that's going to have a huge impact. One is in infrastructure. So you think about smart grid or you think about the transportation infrastructure, uh, which we think of as sort of passive uh, hard objects will be turned into smart, intelligent uh, systems, engineered systems that will provide much greater value, will be much more resilient much much smarter so I, I think that is a, is a big area of, uh, of change that is coming uh, going in a little different direction uh, I see that we are approaching the end of Moore's law scaling and certainly NSF is very very interested and has been investing in that space uh, it's hard to know what will replace uh, or what will come after uh, the silicon technology matures, uh, but surely that's now within sight that in the next 10 years uh, we might see significant changes in the next generation of computing technology. I just make note of the fact that IBM uh, is making a big announcement in this area. I think they're spending several billion dollars to uh, seed uh, new, new uh, technologies that would uh, take place of uh, our beloved CMOS technology. Uh, but I, I expect that to be a, a, a big change that we will probably see in the coming years. Another big area is uh, wireless spectrum. Uh, how Spectrum is a very valuable, finite resource. We are funding a lot of research in this space and we expect that the uh, results of that research ought to lead to much more efficient use of, of spectrum for much greater benefit to society, businesses, people. Uh, and, and, so forth. Then there is the whole bio frontier. So what I call the biomedical frontier. Ranging, so engineered systems are interacting with the biological world at multiple scales, going all the way to genes and cells, to uh, organs and, uh, and ecosystems. Uh, and I think engineering is transforming uh, what's happening in the biomedical space. Just to give you a few examples, uh, we are funding a fair amount in synthetic biology. It's a new field, very rapidly growing, absolutely amazing advances are happening and I think they're going to have huge impact. Uh, neuroscience, the president uh, announced about a year ago the Brain Initiative and Engineering Director plays a huge role in uh, innovative neurotechnologies that can help us understand the brain help us deal with neurological diseases as well as help with uh, people with disabilities. Engineering community has faced major challenges with respect to education and I divide them into two parts. One is the actual uh, education that they get in the classroom and outside of the classroom. So that uh, revolves around uh, fundamental science as well as uh, preparation for professional work uh, including teamwork, uh, communications, uh, ethics, so on and so forth. 
the another area that we uh, see as a major challenge is attracting students from diverse backgrounds to enter the field of engineering women uh, african americans hispanics native americans and so forth uh, that re has remained a major challenge for engineering it's, it's a challenge for all sciences uh, but it's a particular challenge for engineering and we are very heavily focused on this so in fact we have just created a uh, a new program that uh, faculty from ASWE community can apply to uh, is called uh, RED, R-E-D, Revolutionizing Engineering Departments. Our idea behind this program is to focus on department as the unit of change uh, for a whole host of reasons. Because students most closely affiliate with the department. Department chairs provide the leadership in terms of teaching assignments, uh, student advising, uh, and, and uh, are connected with the industry in their areas through industry advisory boards. So we are asking the question, if we focus in, in department as the locus of change and present these challenges uh, that, that I just articulated, uh, can they think about transformations in the, in the way they conduct the business or conduct the educational practice? Can we make a major impact? So we have created a program in partnership with Computer Science Directorate as well as our Education and Human Resources Directorate for a, a sizable program uh, called RED and I'm really hoping that we're going to get very creative and imaginative proposals to address this opportunity because the work that our uh, grantees do has very often very clear societal benefits. So in fact, we work with the National Science Foundation leadership to showcase engineering research for the benefit of society. So let me just take one program that we are very proud of that is I think having huge impacts. And that's the i -Corps program. So as you know, the i -Corps program connects uh, uh, professors, graduate students and mentors to uh, the marketplace in a market discovery type of program to figure out if that invention has commercial potential. Uh, it is an absolutely transformative program. And people, uh, you know, the policymakers really love it because they see a very intentional effort to transform the fruits of research into societal benefit. Um, we, we can look back and point to numerous examples where engineering research has really had palpable impacts. Let me just take uh, one example, which is we all know 3D printing has become a hot industry. Well, you know, we funded fundamental research in additive manufacturing in the 70s and 80s. Uh, the grant to Professor Joe Beeman at UT Austin was made by engineering directorate in the 80s that led to the very early work in additive manufacturing area and we continue to fund that area. Another area that we funded, uh, which is now getting uh, enormous uh, attention, is tissue engineering. I mean, this field didn't exist. Engineering defined the field. Of course, then, you know, we had a lot of involvement from NIH and, and other interested uh, agencies. And what is absolutely amazing is that these two fields have converged. This is one of the real interesting phenomena that we observe is additive manufacturing is converging with tissue engineering. So now we have companies funded by NSF research uh, or, or catalyzed by NSF research that are using 3D printing type of technology to print organs. Now these organs are not ready for use in, you know, for, for us. However, one of some of the early uses are for drug testing or for, for drug development process. So if you had a 3D organ, you could do certain kinds of experiments that would be very difficult to duplicate in sort of in vitro experiments. Now, very often we view research and teaching as being uh, at the at expense of each other. Uh, I think that's a false dichotomy. I think people who are uh, who excel at research also excel at teaching because they both require one common skill, which is to communicate. If you want to excel in research, then you have to communicate as well as uh, if you are teaching. Nevertheless, it is something that most faculty feel uh, as a major challenge. We have to uh, look at the freshman year experience. That is clearly a very, very important part of retention. As a sophomore year, so these two years are, are very critical. Uh, I think it is uh, the social environment plays a big role, uh, especially for female students as well as for underrepresented minorities. 
The other thing that uh, I know and we all know is that students don't get exposed to engineering uh, sufficiently in the freshman year for them to remain excited and engaged in the field of engineering. A lot has changed, uh, in particular because of the uh, coalition program that NSF supported in the 90s where we introduced freshman uh, experience, uh, uh, freshman engineering uh, design and so forth. That has made a big big difference. If you look at engineering careers, a lot of engineers will get their engineering degree and after maybe five years, seven years, ten years, do something else. Sometimes they even do something else right away. They may go to medical school, for example, or go to law school and study intellectual property law. I firmly believe that engineering undergraduate education is a very versatile and important type of education for the 21st century. So even if we were to graduate more students, I think there would be value in what they would bring to society. So I don't think we should worry too much about the exact answer to this question, rather focus on the quality of education. Anybody who wants to become an engineer should have a chance to become one and get a high quality education. And then I think uh, the economy and society will over time calibrate itself as to the, whether the numbers are right or not. NSF, uh, Engineering Directorate, has funded a study with the National Academies to exactly study what you ask, which is, is this a real problem? Is this not a real problem? Help us understand. Maybe the, the answer is more complicated than we would like it to be. That is, either it's yes or no. Uh, it, so for example, uh, we know a uh, lot of, uh, particularly companies in the computer engineering or computer te uh, technology space, saying that they don't have sufficient numbers of, of students to recruit and certainly in certain geographical areas this is a real problem, a documentable problem. Uh, what that does is uh, some of these companies may then decide to do their work elsewhere. So that might reduce the demand. But it wasn't because the demand was low, it's just that it, it's a feedback system. So, so companies are responding to what they are seeing. Suppose a researcher in education comes up with some innovation, some new practice, some new technology, some new idea of how to do this better. How do we, what do we do to see this innovation or this new piece of knowledge actually find use in practice? Now in this case, it's not industry we are talking about in most cases. It may be K through 12 schools. It may be a school, maybe a professor in a department in an engineering college or um, something along those lines. So what we are trying to do is to take the i model and the customer discovery uh, piece of it and applying it to educational innovations. So let's say I've come up with a, with a really fundamentally better way of teaching uh, algebra to ninth graders. Uh, part of i l then asks the question, talk to a hundred potential people who might use your innovation and see uh, if there is a gap between what innovation you have come up with and what the user community would want. And we have done one uh, run of i uh, this this summer. The results are very encouraging. So we fully expect this to uh, become a much bigger program going forward. And again, if we are successful, I think it will have transformative impact because in education space, particularly comparing, comparing it to technology space, uh, the diffusion of innovations doesn't happen uh, with nearly as much speed and uh, universality as it happens in engineering and technology. Uh, simplest thing is look at the NSF funding portal and the search tools that we have placed there. I think you, you can find out a lot about what we are funding in any given space, any given direction. Uh, who are the leading researchers, what are the projects we have funded, what are the outcomes of those projects by just browsing and using our search tools on the NSF website. So I would say that's sort of the lowest hanging fruit by which people can find out what uh, what's happening uh, at NSF. We uh, sponsor workshops all the time and keeping track of the kind of workshops we are sponsoring because that tells you the kind of issues we are we are interested in, the kind of issues that are confronting the research communities. Uh, we also publish from time to time reports, we uh, fund uh, places like National Academies uh, or NRC uh, to analyze issues and then those reports are published and uh, that's uh, another benefit that uh, 
faculty members can can enjoy.